Hello everyone. I'm uh, going to try and introduce you to my thinking about the bridge on the archtop guitar. The bridge is a super important part of the guitar. Uh, you could think of it as the energy transducer that changes the energy that the strings give when energized to air energy that uh, hits our eardrums and makes music. So first of all, the bridge can be thought of as an important brace on the top of the guitar. Even though it's not glued to the top, um, which is nice because we were free to wiggle it around to get the intonation exactly correct for whatever action we're using. Um, but even though it's not glued to the top, it's being held down with quite a bit of force and uh, becomes a real component of the top. Um, not to be thought of separate from the top in terms of structure, that is. So um, when Orville Gibson first started making his acoustic archtop guitars, he was using what we would now call or think of as flat top bridges uh, that were glued directly to the tops of his archtop guitars, unlike the bridges that we're commonly using now. So sometime in the early part of the 20th century, after the Gibson mandolin and guitar company got started, we start to see instruments that have tail pieces and movable bridges. Um, here's a nice example from 1918. Um, this is an, a Gibson L3. Um, I believe it's birch back and sides. Uh, nice piece of mahogany for the neck ebony board and uh, red spruce top. These were uh, all local materials in the body. Of course, the neck is made of imported wood, but the body was from wood cut in Michigan near Kalamazoo, where it was made. And, and anyway, you can see on this guitar, the, um, the bridge is an unusual kind of structure with two feet and a little decorative point in the center. Um, you can see that it's compensated for the different strings in order to uh, help the guitar play in tune. And while, while, while we're here, we'll see this uh, unusual old style tailpiece that has some uh, bridge pins in it, just like flat top guitar bridge pins except shorter and those pins are there to retain the the strings in the holes just the way they are in a flat top guitar bridge. Anyway so this is a, a pretty good example of what guitars looked like when they first had uh, tail pieces and movable bridges. Oh. rattling but it's a pretty nice guitar <laughs> light so then after that in 1921 Ted McHugh applied for several patents while he was working at Gibson and uh, the two important patents for us today were the adjustable bridge so he's the man that that designed the screw adjustable bridge uh, for the mandolin and also um, the archtop guitar. This was 1921 and it allowed people to regulate their own action uh, to suit their preferences. And these were available in a two foot style and they also came as a continuous style as time went on. Uh, and they, they worked pretty well People got used to being able to adjust the action on an archtop guitar, even though it's not something that you can do on a flat top guitar. But let's talk for a minute about how the bridge works on a guitar. Now, 
It's often said that the archtop guitar bears a resemblance to the violin family of instruments. And although this is superficially true because of the carved plates um, on the archtop guitar, uh, similar to the violin family, one thing that's conspicuous in its absence in our guitar world is the bow. And the bow is an integral part of what a violin is and how a violin is used. I'm sure you'll agree. So the bow is a device that the player can use to put an almost unlimited amount of energy into the string. With good technique, you can play a note that just goes on and on and on. Whereas on the acoustic guitar, we get one chance to hit it with a plectrum or uh, pluck it or hit it with a thumb, and then the guitar has the rest of the job. <laughs> we can't continue to input energy after that initial strike. So one thing that we can see about the difference between the violin bridge behavior and the archtop bridge behavior, which is super important, is the primary direction that the energy comes from. So this is a bridge from a cello, and I've made a little drawing here to kind of show the interior structure of the cello, or here's the thickness of the top, and this is a sound post um, that, that is uh, propped inside the instrument to join the top and the back. It's not glued to the instrument, but rather is a precision fit and it's uh, located very close to the treble foot of the bridge. So this is the treble side of the instrument in this drawing. And then on the other side, there is a single brace in a violin family instrument that we're, we're calling the bass bar. And as you can see, the bass foot of the bridge is directly over the bass bar. So when the string is energized by a violin bow, the string is controlled by the surface of the hair on the bow in such a way that the string is only able to vibrate back and forth uh, in, this, in this way under, underneath the bow's control. And what it means is the string, all the energy in the string is, at least the principal part of it, is either directing the bridge to the left or to the right. And since there's a fairly rigid support here underneath the treble foot of the bridge, we see uh, when we take high speed pictures that the bridge is primarily moving in this direction. So the base foot of the bridge is kind of pumping the lower end of the range by moving the base bar, which connects the whole top. And the treble side of the bridge is involved in some very small uh, movements. And so it, you could think of it that the bridge is divided into a treble function and a bass function in terms of the range of the instrument. Anyway, so on the guitar, we have a very, very different construction. First of all, there's no bow. So when we play a note on the guitar, we're depending on the guitar to sustain uh, that note. We don't have the bow to continue to drive the string. And when we think about what happens to a string when it's plucked, when the string is displaced sideways, the tension of the string goes up. And when the tension of the string goes up, it pulls the bridge in this direction so that the bridge is energized by rolling towards the nut of the guitar. And then when the string releases, goes back to the center, it lets go of the bridge, the bridge restores and rests, um, and then back again this way and so on. So whereas in the violin family instruments, the bridge is primarily moving across the instrument like this. 
In the guitar family instruments, the bridge is primarily moving in this direction. So it's a 90 degree difference and it's a big, big difference in how the bridge behaves. Now, going back to this old Gibson guitar, we can see how this bridge probably took a cue from the violin family bridge. Um, and as we understand more about the instrument, um, as the instrument evolves and takes on new subtleties and performance values, we find that the bridge is really, really important to the sound of the guitar. I was fortunate as a young guy to uh, make friends with Jimmy DeQuisto. He was a wonderful friend. He uh, taught me a lot um, and gave me a lot of confidence in the early part of my work. One day, I, uh, in 1977, summer of 1977, I came to his shop with this guitar and it was brand new. Um, I just finished it. I was excited because I tried out a bunch of different ideas in construction. Um, there are six braces inside this guitar. Um, maybe we'll talk about that someday, but anyway, there was, um, the bracing is different. <clears throat> The arching on the guitar is asymmetrical. You may be able to see the apex of the arches way over here on the treble side, where it's normally in the center. So I push the center of the arch over to this side of the guitar. Um, and it actually was inspired by John D'Angelico's work. I saw an instrument where he had done that at Matt Yumino's shop, and it, uh, it influenced me in that way. I devised a new way of attaching the tailpiece to the guitar. Uh, I made some other changes. The, the bridge, as you can see on this guitar, doesn't have any adjusters. And I took pains to hollow the bridge from the underside so that uh, it, it would be um, as light as I could make it to try and get better response from the guitar. So, I showed this guitar to Jimmy and he liked it very much. Uh, we talked about bridges and guitar making and went off to have lunch. And while we were at lunch, we couldn't get off the subject of the bridge. And I kept saying, don't you think that the bridge sounds better without the adjusters? And he said, yeah, I did, and he talked to me about some of the things that he'd learned from John D'Angelico, um, about the weight of the bridge, because um, John was fond of drilling some shallow holes in the bottom of the bridge base in order to lighten the bridge. <clears throat> so that inspired my thinking. At any rate, Jimmy pushed back and said, you know, there has to be a way to adjust the bridge. My customers want to be able to adjust their own action. And so uh, in the usual way on a napkin, I drew, um, I drew this bridge for him. And I said, well, what about putting a wedge in between the top and the bottom instead of some screws? And then by shifting the wedge, you can regulate the height of the bridge. We talked about the pros and cons. Um, the cons are that you've got a wedge <laughs> um, that you can catch your hand on or maybe get your shirt sleeve involved with in, an, in, a, in a way that you don't want. <laughs> um, it's also not very versatile in that you, you can move the wedge a lot and it doesn't change the action very much. So maybe you might have to make several wedges for a guitar in order to get a full range of adjustment. And at some point I just said, yeah, it's an idea, but it's not a great idea. And um, I, I thought also that it would be difficult to keep all the parts from moving since the, all these parts would be made out of wood, um, usually ebony, I guess we, we would use for the bridge parts. And I thought, well, the, the parts are going to be rocking, the parts are going to lose energy. And so anyway, I never 
I never ended up using this, and I just built this model for <laughs> for today's show uh, to to show you what the where this uh, originated from. Anyhow, I ended up deciding that for my work, I was uh, insistent on using a non-adjustable bridge. I knew they sounded better, and I decided that um, it was worth whatever it took to figure out how to adjust the action by adjusting the neck, and we'll have a segment on this later, but here's how that works. So there's high action and low action, and the bridge doesn't need to move. The bridge can just do its job of being the transducer between the strings and the membrane that is the top. So here in, in front of us, we have a bunch of bridges. You can see that I, I take the trouble to make them hollow. Um, I've experimented with different materials. There's uh, oh, Brazilian rosewood and Pernambuco ebony. Uh, here's a spruce bridge with an ebony top. Uh, here's a, a maple bridge, which actually um, fits this, uh, this old guitar from 40 something years ago. And, and I was auditioning different materials to try and find out what was the best material for the bridge. I do like hard materials for the bridge, uh, although uh, spruce bridges have a, a kind of a cool thing about them. Ultimately, I think all of us tend to prefer the, the stiffer, heavier uh, ebony material or something else in that hardwood, tropical hardwood family like Pernambuco or Brazilian rosewood. So this is the kind of bridge I'm building now, and I'm going to show you the uh, important part of this process, which is getting the bridge to fit the guitar perfectly. Again, I think of the, the bridge as a brace, an important brace, and it's very, very important to me that the, the whole surface of the bridge outline, the bridge perimeter, touches the top everywhere. And a subtlety that you might not notice in the lessons is that I cut the bridge a little bit more in the center after it's perfectly fit. I relieve a tiny bit of material in the center of the bridge so that the bridge loads up on the outside ends first when the strings are pressing down and it actually distorts the top and kind of curls and, and positively loads the top a little bit, and I feel I get better response from that little subtle detail. So um, I think it's probably time to launch into how this all works and show you the mechanics of this. Um, when we're all done, we'll have this guitar strung up and uh, and playing. It's um, it's a mahogany guitar with a Sitka top, and uh, it's a nice big sounding instrument. Thanks for watching.